Hello, in this video I'm going to solve the uh, questions to the diagnostic testing robot robust inference question set. Here you can see the first question. We uh, have, the, that's not a lot of information given, but it should all be quite obvious what's happening here. Is we have, we've estimated some regression. The regression residuals are UT and as the regression residuals are UT, the um, estimated regression residuals will be ut hat and to that we now have four auxiliary regressions a to d and for each of that we have to answer a couple of questions or complete the missing information so it also asks is are we testing for autocorrelation or heteroscedasticity in the beginning so let's start with the first we we'll start the most important bit is what's the dependent variable of the auxiliary regression for a that is ut hat squared and we know if we use the squared residuals, then what we are testing for is heteroscedasticity. On the right hand side, we will have everything that can potentially explain variation in the error variance. So anything that may explain heteroscedasticity. We have four explanatory variables here. xt, xt squared, zt and zt squared. So when we have, when we test for heteroscedasticity, our null hypothesis is, let me just note that here, that all these four coefficients, alpha one to alpha four, are zero. That's gonna be our null hypothesis, and that's the null hypothesis of homoscedasticity. Homoscedasticity. We are testing four restrictions, that means our decrease of freedom for our test we already know are four. Now what's the test statistic? How do we calculate um, the statistic with which we uh, test this null hypothesis? It's going to be n times r squared. So n times r squared and we have these pieces of information here. 45 observations, the r squared is 0 0.089 and uh, the solution here is going to be 4.005 and we have four degrees of freedom now the question is what is uh, the p-value of uh, this test statistic now we can either go to uh, statistical tables what i want to do here is i'm just going to quickly show you how to get them from matlab so let me just quickly call up matlab here we go the command you need is the command called chi square cdf and uh, let's just call help so we can see how to uh, how to use that command so what it needs as inputs is x that's going to be the value of the uh, test statistic and it uh, requires v that's going to be the decrease of freedom now when we, let me just have a little note up here. Okay, so there's a little MATLAB note here. When we uh, use chi to, sorry, CDF, CDF, what we get, you know, a chi-square distribution is gonna look something, something like this. Okay, for for v decrease of freedom, so we have x and v. So that's going to be chi squared for v decrease of freedom. Now, whatever value we put in x, what the function is going to give us is going to be the area underneath the curve up to x. Now, when we want the p-value, of course, we know. What we want is this value, okay? The p-value is the tail probability. So to get the p-value, what we really need is one minus that function. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do here. Our we have four degrees of freedom and our test statistic is 4.005. So what we want to calculate is one minus chi-squared CDF 4.005 and for decrease of freedom and what we get is 0 0.4053 so let's go back here we have 
0.4053. That is our um, p-value and we know the last question is do we reject the null hypothesis or not? We know for a, a chi-square test we will reject for very large values or using the p-value we reject h naught if the p-value is smaller than the alpha. Now we are meant to use an alpha of 0 0.01. The p-value is actually larger than alpha so we do not reject. H naught in this example. Okay, so that's all the information required for auxiliary regression A. So let's continue to B. Firstly, we'll see now we are not having as a dependent variable in the auxiliary regression the squared residuals, but we have the residuals themselves. And on the right hand side, as explanatory variables, we have importantly lagged values of this residual. So that's a clear indication that we are testing for autocorrelation. Okay, so here we are testing for autocorrelation. You see that there is also an XT in here. That's most likely. The question actually doesn't say that precisely an explanatory variable from the regression and you know that whenever you have estimated or less residuals on the left hand side of an auxiliary regression you have to include the explanatory re variables of that ox uh, original regression into your auxiliary regression. We know that these two guys ut hat and xt will be uncorrelated so that xt is not going to contribute to any positive r squared. Yeah, it's not important because when we are testing our null hypothesis of no autocorrelation, let's just have another dividing line here, what we are testing is only that coefficients alpha 2 and alpha 3 are equal to 0. And that's equivalent to no autocorrelation. HA is that any, that either um, alpha 2 and or alpha 3 are unequal to 0. And that is the case where we have autocorrelation. So, in the side of this, the test statistic is again going to be n times r squared. And here we go, 247 times 0 of 4, that is 9.88. 9.88 degrees of freedom, we're testing two lags, so we're having two degrees of freedom. Uh, we need the p-value again. You can do that this exactly as it did before. I'll just tell you the result. You can confirm that you can get the same, 0 0.0072. If you use tables, you'll only be able to say that the p-value is perhaps smaller than 1% or between 1% and half a percent, depending on the table which you have. So, however, the decision rule is again, sorry, the decision rule is reject H naught if P is smaller than alpha, alpha, using an alpha of 1%, that one is smaller than alpha, so we do reject H naught in this case. Okay, so this should be quite routine by now. Now, part C, auxiliary regression C. Again, we are having squared estimated residuals, and that immediately leads to the conclusion that we are testing for heteroscedasticity. On the right hand side, we have two explanatory variables that immediately tells us that we have two degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. Now the hypothesis is going to be that alpha 1 and alpha 2 are equal to 0 and that means homoscedasticity. 
how much can does this do? So neither ZT nor XT contribute to explaining variation in UT hat squared. Now we are again given our n and our test statistic is n times r squared again but we are not given an r squared so where do we get this r squared from? Well we know that for this one case we've actually been given the p-value so how can we how can we possibly work back from this? Well given we have the p-value we know there's only one particular x, let's go back to this little graph, there's only one particular x corresponding to the value of the test statistic that exactly leaves us 0 0.05 in here. So that means well, we should be able to find that x value, so we should be able to find that test statistic. Once we have the test statistic we can solve that equation, we have the n for the r squared and then we know what the r squared is. So first step is we need to find out what that x is. So which value in the chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom cuts off five percent of the distribution. Again we'll ask our friend MATLAB to help us here. So I call up MATLAB and the uh, function that will help us now is chi-squared inf. So what we need here is a p-value and the decrease of freedom and what we'll get out is our x. So let's briefly go to our uh, graph again. So we'll supply the p-value, uh, in our case 0 0.05, we will supply the v and what we will get is the x. So in our case we have 2 and 0 0.05, so we have I to n um, oh, point R. okay before we do this this is sort of uh, similar to the previous case what is asked is not the tail probability but what MATLAB actually asked for is this probability okay so 1 minus the tail so what we actually have to input is 0 0.95 and you just need to know, you just need to know these uh, things, you can read that in that help function I will tell you exactly, so 0 0.95 2 degrees of freedom and what we get is 5.9915 5.9915 so that x here in our case in C is 5.9915 and that means that this is the test statistic because we know that our test statistic produced a p-value of exactly 5% so we're reverse engineering this and now we have an equation here 5.9915 equals n times r squared we have our n that's 135 and you can solve that equation and confirm that the r squared is 0 0.0444. So again, the question is, do we reject the null hypothesis? We have a p-value of 5% that's larger than alpha. So here we do not reject. Do not reject. So we have no heteroscedasticity. So let's go to the last case D very similar we are starting with looking at what uh, dependent variable we have in the auxiliary regression UT that immediately leads us to recognizing that we are testing for autocorrelation we're having one lagged here so one lagged error term so we are testing for autocorrelation of all the one h naught will be equivalent to h3 is equal to zero. The other two terms uh, are explanatory variables in the original model that have to appear here. So this time we are not given n but we are given the r squared but we know that the test statistic is n times r squared. We are also given a p-value that means we can find out what that test statistic is okay we'll get that in a second and once we have that we can find out what the n is because you have the r squared 
So p value of one and one degrees of freedom. So that means we go back to MATLAB. This time p value of one, so one minus the p value is 0 0.99. Degrees of freedom one, so 6.6349 is the test statistic. 6.6349 and then we can solve that and that will give us an n of 1021 and lastly are we rejecting the null hypothesis we are still working on the same uh, decision rule it's always the same so uh, let's just look at it here I've written it down before reject h0 if the p-value is smaller than alpha Alpha is 1%, p-value is 1%, so here we actually have a marginal decision, okay, so um, a marginal decision. Will this happen in practice? Extremely unlikely, okay, so um, depending on, it, this is just, you know, basically constructed exactly to give this 1%, usually you'll get slightly below or slightly above 1% and then you can make a decision. All right, that was question one. So question two is a bit of a practical question. So I've uh, put onto the website a data file, airfare.xls, and uh, a little bit of a description in airfare.ds. You can open that with any word editor or text editor. So question two. Um, that's the airfare, airfare question. Okay, so let's just briefly look at the data. So I created a, uh, a little MATLAB file exercise here. I um, uploaded the airfare data. Let's look at the airfare description. We have all sorts of variables here. Uh, year variable, the interesting ones here are the fare, okay, average one-way fare. We know the destinations and the origins and the destination, so clearly different uh, flights will give you different fares. And we also know uh, the distance between the origin and the destination, the average passenger number per day for that particular route, uh, and importantly the fraction uh, of the, uh, the market share of the biggest carrier on that particular route. And we have all sorts of log variables here and we have here dummies. So what we're going to do here in general, we're going to postulate the, the following sort of uh, relation. Uh, the fare is going to be a function of a constant of the distance alpha to the average passenger number uh, alpha three I call MS the market share of the of the biggest carrier and we will put year dummies in so let's call them alpha four times uh, D ninety eight. So that value will take one if a particular fare was uh, taken in year 98, D99 and D, uh, I forgot, I coefficient. So we need an alpha six here, D00, zero zero, and we have an error term epsilon i. So that's a pretty long model here. We have uh, six explanatory variables plus a constant. One, two, three, four, five, six. Three of them are dummy variables. Remember our observations come from four different years, so we can put in three dummy variables. So, and we also know, we, we also have origin and destination information. So the question here is now, the following. I just uh, quote from my exercise sheet. You want to investigate whether flights to and from New York follow a different relationship than those involving other cities. 
you suspect that the effect of the market share and that of the average passenger numbers differs between flights in general and those flights involving New York. So we have this relationship here between uh, the fare on the left hand side as dependent variable and all these explanatory variables and what you suspect is that the relationship between the average passenger numbers and the market share with these fares that is currently described by these two coefficients alpha 2 and alpha 3 that this relationship may be different if we are talking about flights that involve um, that involve uh, New York so if you go to, to the lecture notes so we're going to follow this basically the script from the lecture notes so first we're going to do a little bit of uh, easing on notification we're going to uh, turn the model into a matrix form we say f and this is now a uh, vector we don't have a subscript uh, is equal to a big matrix x times alpha plus epsilon where x is equal to our constant the vector of the distances, vectors of average passenger numbers, vector of market share and the three dummy variables. So we have seven terms in here we are estimating seven coefficients altogether. So that is our original model. Okay, But now you suspect that these two, uh, these two guys play a more complicated role, P and MS. Now in your lecture notes you find that what we want to do is possibly we want to estimate a more general model. We have F equals X alpha plus W beta plus epsilon. Now, and to be uh, correct, I need to distinguish between these two alphas and the error terms. This will be our unrestricted model. So that is an unrestricted model. It's more general compared to this one up here, which is going to be our restricted model. So, and therefore, I call these error terms R and these U and that alpha is a restricted alpha and that is an unrestricted one. These two guys are not necessarily the same. So the question now remains how do we define our W? Because you know if we can write down our sort of alternative model where we allow for different effects of P and MS, if we can write it down in this form then all we need to do is perform sort of a standard F test on uh, on this beta. Then we'll, we'll want to test whether that beta is equal to zero. So this is what we want to do in the end. Okay, we want to test a null hypothesis that beta is equal to zero, and that's going to correspond to saying that New York flights are not different. The alternative is going to be, of course, that beta is unequal to zero and that represents saying that New York flights are different. And then we're going to look at if they are different, how they are different. So the, the issue remains is the definition of the W. And the W will really only involve these two guys, P and ms and somehow we need to allow for these terms to differ or the, the effect of p and ms to differ if we are talking about new york flights what we're going to do is we're going to multiply each of them with a dummy variable d where d i the i-th element of d is going to be equal to one if origin origin or destination are equal to New York and zero otherwise. 
Okay, so this is what we need to construct. We need to construct a new matrix W that involves two terms. And these two terms, the first one is P, our average passenger numbers on each, remember these are vectors, for each flight multiplied with a dummy variable where dummy variable is equal to one if that flight involves New York and zero otherwise. And then the same with the market share variable market share times the same dummy variable which is one if the flight involves New York. So you know, estimating f and then you know we'll, we'll get to that in a, uh, in a minute we have to apply an f test which involves estimating both of these uh, models and then looking at residual sum squares that's all quite straightforward. The question is now in MATLAB how do you do this? Okay this one here in particular how do you define the dummy the dummy variable. So that's what we're going to uh, look at uh, in the next couple of minutes. So here I prepared uh, this little file. Actually before we continue, let me just show you something. You, know, you can look at what this is. We have we had this this subplot stuff. We had that in, a, in another case. I just wanted to to plot something. Let me just show you what we have here. You know, sometimes you, that's always the question, should we model log, log models, log linear models? And here I just plotted a scatter plot of all different combinations of uh, log fare and log distance. And that's most likely going to be the two most important variables here. And check whether there's any, any clear guidance. Now, these all look pretty much fairly linear, although this one here seems to have sort of a little bit of a non-linear drift. This one equally, um, this one not so much. So this one here, in the bottom right hand corner is the log-log model. This one's the level-level model. And this one, I can't quite remember which. There's one level, one log. And I, here we can see the fair. This is log fair and level distance. Here we have uh, level fare and log distance. Now which one looks the most linear? I actually think the top left one. That's the level level model. So that's why, why we are estimating a level level model here. That's a pretty superficial way of going about it. But for this uh, example, let's continue with this. So now what we want to do is uh, we want to be able to estimate the original model, but then also model with only uh, New York data. Let's look at the um, our data. Okay, so this is now a spreadsheet with all our variables, and you can see in columns two and three we have NAN. These are not numbers. If you look at the text variables, we can actually see what these are. These are in column two the origin, and in column three the destination. So the first observation is a flight from Akron to Atlanta. So. What we now want to do is we want to identify all those flights that involve New York. So we'll, we need to check whether certain elements are equal. And you know, you've learned before when we're dealing with numbers, the way how we can test whether something is equal is using the equal command. So for instance, uh, 3 is 3 equal to well, let's say um, 12 divided by 4 and the answer is of course yes uh, or is 3 equal to 4 the answer is no which is a zero now does that work with text as well well we can try uh, I just tried okay so you can uh, you can try is n and you have to put text um, actually, if you look at the text, uh, let's look back at the text, you see these are all text fields, but they all have an inverted comma uh, around here. In MATLAB, to indicate something is text, you use simple commas, but MATLAB has imported these inverted commas. So we would have to ask is, for instance, let's use the first one, Acron. O H O H will want to be case sensitive 
is that the same as itself? So can we use that equal sign again? And you can see what happens is it actually sort of compares it element by element. Okay, lots of ones because it uh, it compares each character to e to each on of the other ones. So that's not really what we want. Now I had to look a little bit, and now you can learn from my uh, looking. The command which we want is called string compare. Okay, so it's strcmp. If we compare, for instance, our two identical strings again, what we now get is a one. And if we just change anything, let's say we were just to take out the comma in this string, if we compare these two, we get the answer zero. They're not the same. So what we now need to find out is how exactly New York is um, represented in here. So let's just scroll down. Here we go. Here we have a New York. So what we need is New York, all capital with space, comma, and then NY. So this is how New York is represented. So what we now want is we want to find the data. Let me just comment all the plots out. We want to find the data uh, where, let's say, we have uh, New York as the origin. So let's call that uh, cell one for starters. So now we have not a chrome, but we have uh, this is space New York and Y. So if that is equal to what? Well, we want to look in the text matrix. And what we are interested in is columns two and three. So what we uh, all we can do is let's start just to look at it. We look at column two only, and we'll just run the code and then see what the uh, result is. So that means we get a new vector of binary values, cell one. And you can see there's all sorts of zeros. In fact, most of them are zeros. We have more than 4,000 observations. Let's just see where do we get any any ones here. We got another ones here. Uh, we just want to make sure we did the right thing, starting with 3733. So let's just look at the text data. We go down to 3733. And this is exactly where the New York origins start. Okay, 3733. So that has done the right thing. This is how has done exactly what we want. So that variable will give us the uh, um, New York origins, but now we also want the destination. So what we actually gonna do is we're gonna look at columns two and three. Let's run it again and let's see what we get. Now we get two columns and now we get the first column is exactly as before and the second column does exactly what we did before with the third column. So you can see here, uh, for instance, let's find a one on um, the second column here, 653. There are four flights which have New York as a destination. So let's just check that in rows 653. Okay, indeed, there's New York for four destinations. So that works exactly as uh, as we wanted. But now we want one dummy variable that really that tells us all the flights where New York is involved, either as origin or destination. Well, uh, we can do that quite easily. Let's talk, let's just call it dumb for dummy. And all we're going to do is we're going to calculate the sum of cell one across the rows. So that's comma two. 1 would give us the column sum and what we want to know is whether that sum is larger than zero because if the sum is larger than zero then we are dealing with a New York flight and then we just create a binary variable a boolean variable we are asking is that sum larger than zero here we go calculate that again and uh, what we get is what do we have it here? 
a vector. So we have a column vector and we should get the occasional one. Okay, so here five to one, there are four New York flights and then further down, what was it, three, seven, uh, three, three, we should get the flights with New York as origin, so there should be quite a lot. Yeah, there are quite a lot now. These are all New York origin flights. So that did exactly what we wanted to. So now we can define our y, x and w for our regression. y equals data. Uh, now which column is the airfare? Airfare is in column 7. So we have data, 7. Then our x. Uh, how many observations do we have? Let's uh, do that actually first. n equals size of data comma one. It's the number of observations. Then we want a, uh, a constant, so we have a vector of ones of length n. Then we want variables from data, all rows. Now a number of columns that come into square brackets. So let's see which columns we want. We want distance, that's column 5, passenger average, that's 6, market share, that's 8, and the three dummies, 10, 11, and 12. So 5, 6, 8, 10 to 12. 5, 6, 8, 10, and 12. Okay, so now we have y and x. Now we can call a regression function. Before we do that, we'll also define our w as we uh, discussed before. Okay, so that should be the p variable times the dummy variable and the market share variable times the dummy variable. So that is going to be now what. Uh, was the p variable, the p variable was the sixth column and then times the dummy variable and the market share was the eighth column and again, oops, I forgot the multiplication, so we're talking about element by element multiplication, that's where the dot comes from, times done. This is our W, so let's just calculate it so far just to make sure we haven't done a mistake. Okay, here we go. Here we have our X. These are seven explanatory variables. Then we have a W. Let's just look at the W and the X next to each other. This column should be equal to zero whenever New York isn't involved on both of these columns. Whenever New York's involved, that should be equal to columns here, three and four, passenger average and market share, times a one. So it should be equal to these guys. So let's just go down further down here, for instance, 77. Let's go down to 77 over here as well. Here we go. Okay, and what we have here is 41, which is exactly that value, 363 which is exactly equal. Okay, so that worked, that dummy variable operation. All right, now equipped with these dummy variables, we just now need to call our OLS est function. Now, I um, uh, gave you in this module a new OLS est function, OLS underscore hack, that also produces white and new vest standard errors. Uh, let's actually just briefly look at this. So it has the normal standard errors B, S, E, and then the white B, S, E, and new West B, S, E. Otherwise, it's exactly the same as the previous ones. We want to call this function. All we need to do is we need to say, do we want output? Yes. What are Y and X? Y and X are Y and X. And we want to estimate a regression where we have y and as explanatory variable we have x and w and we want to uh, differentiate the output we know for the f test what we will need is the residual sum of squares so it's these guys so we call that as s restricted and this will be the unrestricted model that is as su 
and let's estimate these models. Okay, here we go, it has done everything. So we've, we have estimated two models. We get two outputs here, that's model one, that's model two. What we'll need is these ISS values from here and from here. So with that, we're now gonna go back to calculate our F test. So let's go back to, uh, to our question. We have now estimated our two models. And now we want to know how to test this uh, hypothesis. It's a multiple restriction, so we're using an F test. And uh, we know that what we need is, uh, I have some hiccups, I apologize for that. Restricted ISS minus unrestricted ISS. RSS divided by something divided by restricted uh, sorry unrestricted RSS divided by something now this uh, value here in the uh, denominator denominator is the number of restrictions in our case that is two and down here we have the decree decrease of freedom of the unrestricted model that is our number of observations minus the number of estimated parameters in x we have seven in w we have two so altogether that's nine so um these two values for res uh, restricted uh, residual sum of squ squares we can find from our matlab output we could now time of here are uh, our the first model was the restricted model. Uh, so that's RSSR restricted and that's RSSR unrestricted. We know RSSR unrestricted ought to be smaller than the restricted one. You can also see that the R squared in the unrestricted model 4615 is larger than the R squared in the restricted model 4249. But rather than typing all of this, of course we use MATLAB do this so we want to calculate the F test oh, you can you know if you have the values you can do that by hand as well and we have as restricted minus as s unrestricted divided by 2 because we could just calculate the number of columns in W that's the number of restrictions we calculate but we know what the result is as s Restricted divided by n, that was our number of observations, minus 9. Uh, we need another parenthesis here. Here we go, so that's our f test. Now we also want the p value, so the p value is going to be 1 minus f cdf. Now it's very similar to the command, the chi squared cdf command we used. We need, and you can see it tells us here the test statistic. We calculated that as F test, and then the two degrees of freedoms, and they're gonna be two and nine. Ah, uh, sorry, two and n minus nine. Okay, the degrees of freedom are just equal to the um, uh, to the uh, scalar factors. Let's just go back. We know that F. Under the null hypothesis, f is going to be f distributed with 2 and n minus 9 degrees of freedom. So since we're going to calculate, uh, use MATLAB to calculate the p-value, we're going to use the following decision rule, reject h0 if p-val is smaller than alpha. Now, did I say what alpha we should use? I don't think I did. So let's use an alpha of 0 0.05. So in MATLAB, here we go. We've done everything. So we'll just calculate that and then check our values. So our F test is 1562301. That is 156.2301. Uh, 
and the p value p p p p val is zero okay so it's basically it's very small um, it's virtually zero so the p value is zero and therefore our conclusion is we reject h naught h naught said that new york flights are not different so we conclude new york flights are different to those of the of all other destinations so let's go back to matlab to just quickly sort of see in what way they are different so remember let's go to our restricted model first what for our variables a constant as positive well having price on the left hand side it's not surprising then the first variable is the distance now what you can see here that's actually different to what you've seen before these are now three standard errors i don't report t stats here anymore because it depends on which ones you use and you can always see they are quite similar but always somewhat different so here this is the coefficient to distance uh, in our notation here that is alpha one hat it's positive so the larger the distance the higher the fares makes sense and clearly significant if you divide that by any of these standard errors you get uh, a very large value uh, something like 40 around 40 you get then second that is the average number of passengers that's negative that means the more passengers there are on average the smaller the price again that sounds quite reasonable um, I suppose we have more competition the more passengers there are so um, airlines can use larger planes that um, make flying cheaper and again this is uh, significant although yeah the T stats will be around 5 depending on which stat, uh, standard area you use this is the market share the larger the market share the larger the fare uh, so the larger the market share of the leading firm that means there's more power of the leading competitor and that results in larger fares okay we know uh, more competition would mean smaller market share we know that better and more competition will usually lead to lower prices and that, you can see that here so the effect of these two coefficients are the ones where, which you want to evaluate whether they change for new york flights or not and then we have three year dummies and the first one isn't significant the second one is marginally significant t tests will be here just over two the third one so in the year 2000 there really seems to be there seems to have been a price hike but that of course could be inflation inflationary uh, effect as well all right so now we calculated our unrestricted model let me briefly go back to our to our model so what we now have is a w term let me to, to interpret let me copy the w in here okay and the w basically refers to this guy p times d and ms times d so let's say we have an observation that doesn't involve new york then these two variables will be zero. And that means the only variable, let's look at the, uh, the passenger uh, case, the passenger variable, that guy will be zero, this guy will be zero. That means the only relevant guy is this one, is this one up here. That means the coefficient that's relevant is that to that variable P, alpha two. Now alpha two is here, this guy it's negative as before but uh, yeah so it's negative so again if we are talking about a flight that doesn't involve New York uh, the more passengers we have there's going to be a negative effect so what about what however if we have a flight that involves New York then we have this term still okay P and there's the coefficient alpha 2 to this but then this guy here will also be p okay and uh what coefficient are we going to have what did we say in uh w has coefficient beta one 
coefficient to, to this one is our beta. The coefficient to this one is going to be beta 1, and that's going to be the coefficient to this is going to be beta 2. So if we are talking about the New York flight, the effect of passengers is actually going to be, of the passenger variable, is going to be alpha 2 plus beta 1. So what is alpha 2 plus beta 1? Now beta 1 is this guy down here, the second last variable. So what we have is negative 0 0.0152 plus 0 0.0135. So we have a term that's actually very, very close to zero. So it appears as if that negative effect, remember, that was more passengers on the route, smaller price. For New York flights, that doesn't really seem to, to be valid, okay? Because these two guys cancel each cancel each other out. To see whether they really cancel each other out, we would want to test whether they are equal to zero, uh, whether the sum of these two is equal to zero. So we would need another test for that, but we don't do that here. So that means the, this um, price dampening effect of uh, high demand routes is not valid for New York routes. And let's look at uh, the market share again if we are talking about um, a route that doesn't involve New York, the effect of the market share will be restricted to this variable because this one is going to be ms times zero. That's going to disappear. So the only coefficient we're interested in is the alpha three. So and the alpha three is the this positive guy seventy six. So that was positive. So what about if we have a flight that involves New York, then we are interested in alpha 3 plus beta 2. Where's beta 2? Beta 2 was this last coefficient here. It's another positive one. So we have 76 or 77 plus 84. That's more than doubling the effect. So that means if we are talking about market share, and we already said before that this, the higher the market share of uh, of the largest supplier, the largest airline, the higher the prices. This effect is even more pronounced in the case of New York. Okay, so um, that that is a quite startling effect. So that was all we needed to answer question two. The next question deals with robust inference. And it's a, it's a little bit of an algebraic question here. So we have, we are dealing with question, um, so robust inference. Inference and here it is question one. And uh, what was asked is show that the following is equal x prime omega x equal to the sum for i equals 1 to n of sigma i squared times xi xi prime if omega equals the following sigma 1 squared sigma 2 squared all the way down to sigma n squared and zeros everywhere else. So everywhere on the off diagonal zeros. But on the diagonal we have different values. We know that's the situation which we described with heteroscedasticity. And why is this guy important? Because we need it in the calculation of standard errors for beta hat Okay, so in particular, the variance of beta hat was a matrix and that required, let's just write it down, that was x prime x inverse x prime omega x x prime x inverse. Okay, in that situation, so we're concerned about this in a term. The question is now show that this and these are equal. First, so this is just a little bit of matrix algebra. Uh, first, let's we know what omega looks like. Let's write down what x look looks like, and um, so we know x looks like this: the first variable, first observation, first variable, second observation, all the way to first variable, nth observation, 
second variable, first observation, and the fourth uh, big matrix, and then all the way to how many have we got here? Um, let's say we have k variables, so we have x k first, x k second, all the way to x k nth. And the way how I'm going to make this a little simpler now is I'm going to say that um, this is equal to actually uh, which, ah that's not what I wanted. Uh, let me just run this away exactly. So so that was equal to to x, and I'm going to write this sort of basically in a column vector form where I say this is x1 um, x1 prime x2 prime x3 prime all the way to xn prime and what is x1? x1 is basically uh, let me just do this in a different color x1 is basically just this first or x1 prime is just this guy Okay, x1 prime is this. That means that x1 is the same as a column vector of x11, x21, all the way to xk1. Okay, so I'll just put this in into this because we will always uh, turn out we will always need these rows. Okay, so that will be x1 prime is this this row up here. So um, now we start. Now we can uh, rewrite x prime omega x. That is going to be the same as here we have x. x prime is of course just this entire guy laid down as a row uh, vector, so that's all the way up to xn. Then we have our omega, and then we have exactly we have x, which is just what we had here: x1 prime, x2 prime, all the way to xn prime. Now, of course, we know that this omega is just going to come from um, from up here right okay this is going to be the omega so let's just uh, see let's leave that um, for uh, last X let's leave that untouched and what we're gonna do is we're gonna combine the first two terms let's see so what we have here is an x1 times a sigma 1 squared and then everything else all these guys going to be multiplied with these with these zeros up here that means they all disappear so what we're going to have here is x1 times sigma 1 squared in the first column then the next one for the second column here we again will multiply that second column with all this so we get x1 times 0 x2 times sigma 2 squared I'll write that down x2 times sigma 2 squared and then x3 times 0 x4 times 0 all the rest here is going to be 0 again okay so that's going to be our second column and of course we can already see the pattern here that will continue all to the last one where we get xn times sigma n squared so we combined the first the first two terms so that stuff here is equal to that and now we shouldn't forget about our last term so that's x1 prime x2 prime and so forth all the way to xn prime so we've made a lot of progress 
All we now need to do is we have basically two a row and a column vector. We can combine them quite easily. Okay, so we have x1 times sigma 1 squared times x1 prime. So th these guys are the x1, the x1 prime, they are vectors, so we can't easily interchange them, but that sigma 1 squared is a scalar, we can bring that to the front. So we write sigma 1 squared is x1 times x1 prime, then that guy times that guy, so that's, you know, half colors, so let's use colors. So that and that have combined to this. Now we're gonna combine this and this, that's gonna be plus. Again, I bring out the sigma squared, sigma two squared times x2 times x2 prime. And uh, the next is gonna be the third, the imaginary third, and the third here is gonna be sigma three squared x three times x three prime, and that will continue all the way to the last bit, and that's gonna be plus sigma n squared times x n times x n prime, and now you can see how this can be written as a sum of i to n because all terms look similar. It's always the i variance times x i times x i prime. And this is of course exactly uh, what was required. Okay, this is exactly the solution we had asked for. Okay, so what did we have to do is you just had to understand what structure x and sigma had and then you thought about, you know, what, what terms do survive. And an awful lot of terms didn't survive because we had these zeros, quite a lot of zeros on, on the off diagonals of the omega. That made it much easier. You can imagine and that, yeah, we'll see. Uh, that if these guys aren't zero, which the situation of autocorrelation, the result will look somewhat differently. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say. Uh, I said we need this when we calculate white standard errors because uh, the, this formula up here is, uh, what is it? This formula here cannot be used because we don't know what that. Uh, omega is, and that means we don't know what these uh, sigma i squares are. And you know that the proposal by White was to replace these with ui hat squares. Okay, and once you replace these guys with ui hat squares, what you get is White standard errors. The next question is very much related to this and ref refers exactly to that case where we don't have zeros on the off diagonal uh, when we are dealing with autocorrelated uh, residuals. So let's have the second, second question here. So basically the, the question is, let me replicate the variance for the uh, beta hat for all s when we don't have Gauss Markov error terms. Then we have, then we have this. So the question is, what do we do here? What we have, what the omega will be in general, let's think of the diagonal terms first is sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, sigma 3 squared, all the way to sigma n squared. Now, we need basically an estimate of that omega. You know that where the rest, all the rest was zero, I wrote, won't write that down yet, what White had proposed to estimate this guy with replacing this with u1 hat squared, u2 hat squared, and so forth, all the way to un hat squared. 
So now, however, these orthogonal terms won't be zero if you have autocorrelation. What we have here is sigma 1, 2. Here we'll have sigma 1, 3. Here we have sigma 2, 3. These are all covariants that's done here. We have sigma 1, n. Uh, the last one, second, or next to last one is going to be uh, n minus 1, n and so forth. These are all covariances and it's symmetric so they will all replicate on the upper diagonal. So the question is now how do we replace this guy because we don't know the covariance between the first and the second arrow term and the obvious parallel would be to do u1 hat times u2 hat and for this value we would use u1 hat times u3 hat and so forth. Down here we would have u1 hat and un hat. <clears throat> now if you were to write u hat, let's write uh, a vector I'll put an underscore in here to indicate that this is a vector. If we say we have a vector of our estimated residuals, actually we, I don't need uh, I don't need that underscore. So I have a vector all the way to u n hat. How could we represent such an el such an estimate with these vectors? Well, it turns out that if you calculate u hat times u hat prime, what you get is exactly that. Okay, because we'll get uh, think about u hat prime, u hat prime. We have u one hat, u two hat, all the way to u n hat. So if we calculate u hat times u hat prime in the first element we get u1 hat times u1 hat which is u1 hat squared. Um, then here we will get uh, u2 hat times u1 hat, u3 hat times u1 hat and so forth. And indeed on the diagonals you would always get the squared versions. So you would get exactly exactly this guy, okay, if you were to complete it. So this is why why I asked the question, what would happen if you were to estimate variance beta hat or less? Let me go go back to this equation. Wait, that was too much. If in here we would replace this omega to get an estimate for this with u hat times u hat prime. Okay, that would be the, the apparent uh, similar solution to, uh, to the white standard errors. So what we get in this case, let's just look at the center term. What we would get is um, only the center term, center term of variance beta hat over s. That would be x prime u hat u hat prime x, and uh, we can just to make it visually. A little bit clearer. So we have u prime u hat and u hat prime x. So what have we got? What have we got in here? We have basically the cross product of x prime, the explanatory variable in our regression, and the estimated residuals. But we know one of the basic properties of OLS regressions is that x and u hats 
are uncorrelated. And what does that mean? What follows from that is that x prime times u hat is actually equal to zero. So what would we get here, and this you can see this guy is just the prime of this, so what we get is a zero. And then fatally, what this would imply is that the variance of beta hat, now we are talking about an estimated value of that, yeah, because we're estimating the omega hat will basically be zero because the center term if the center term if this guy is equal to zero then everything is equal to zero since we're having a multiplication so and then obviously if you deal with this this is this is not much use okay so this is not useful So this is the uh, the reason why we would uh, end up with such an with, with an estimated zero uh, zero variance. Okay, that's it. If you have any questions with respect to this video, please uh, raise them at, at the beginning of the tutorial. Thank you.